Um, so I, I want to really explore the question posed initially by Anthony, but in some ways answered in, in part by Alison, which is really the whole uh, issue of almost like the institutional, organisational conditions for self-confidence, for popular self-confidence, and for a popular sense of of agency uh, and and of, um, of a sense of sort of the capacity for political power that we saw in the movements in, in Egypt. But, but then there's a the question of what can sustain that there, but also here, what are the, the institutional forms that could, could create the basis for that? Because I think, you know, people talk a lot about, you know, and there's um, somebody I recognize from the previous seminar who talked about people being conned by, you know, the media or people being apathetic. But actually, I, I don't know about you, I mean, obviously there is some of that, but. But I feel that, in a way, the problem is, is not that people people do know what's going on. I mean, OK, they don't know the full picture, but there is a real sense of, you know, something is wrong, there is injustice, there is a pervasive anger. Um, but it doesn't translate into powerful action all the time. I mean, it does burst out. But because of the sort of institutions that we're in that sort of separate us and uh, give us a sense of impotence and it's impossible to, to do anything, and I, I, I think, you know, um, that there have been moments, we've got to look at the moments in, in um, the history of, of the UK where there have been um, mass popular actions and what's happened to them, why they haven't been sustained. And, you know, thinking back historically to, to for example, the general strike and the sense in which historically in Britain there has been a, there has been a sense of class you know, of class capacity, of class action, but of a rather subordinate kind. And I mean, I think one's always got to see it, class, there can be a very narrow notion of class as being about the conflict in the workplace. Or there can be a very broad sense of class, which is really to do with the production, also the appropriation and the distribution of the surplus, of the wealth that in the end is appropriated by the few. And that's a sort of broad sense of almost the people. I mean, you see it in Shelley, you know, um, we are many, they are few. And that's a kind of tradition that's, that's there in our culture. But I think the, if we're thinking institutionally, I think we've got to look at the Labour Party, you know, which I think is now in a sort of deep, deep crisis. So this is an opportunity for us. But we've got to sort of see what's happened and what the legacy of the institutions of the Labour Party have been. Because it's not just about the leadership, it's about the institutions that are, have had deep consequences for our daily lives. And key, I think, in explaining this um, subordinate notion of class, this narrow notion of class, as distinct from the sort of Shellian notion of class, uh, is, is the way in which the Labour Party was, was created, and it's, it's very beginnings, uh, on the basis of a division between um, uh, between a sort of industrial uh, organisation, the, the workplace, and politics, the, the welfare state, the, the international policy, um, social policy, everything, the macroeconomic policy, which was, as it were, you know, a bit like um, Alison talked about the adolescent, it was delegated to the party, it was delegated um, to, to electoral politics. And... And then the Labour Party itself, its organisation, organisational form, which was in a sense at times, it was it was kind of enormous. I mean, you know, thinking, looking at sort of experiences and stories about the sort of 45 and so on, when the Labour Party at a local level was, you know, almost, you know, every, every sort of like socially responsible person, you know, felt, I mean, obviously there were also the Liberals were pretty small by then, but, you know, was in some ways related or contributed to the Labour Party. It was briefly a, a real um, mass party, but it was a mass party that, in a sense, is almost, was almost like a political form of kettling. I mean, it was kind of people were enclosed. The, the, the institutions of the Labour Party had an appearance of, of democracy, you know, all the resolutions, etc. But a reality of, of ultimate decision lying in the hands of of the parliamentary and trade union elite. I mean, look at you know, the absolute sort of, you know, crisis that was caused, and in the end, in a way, split in the Labour Party, when the, the people in the constituency said, said, hang on a minute, we don't like what the government's doing, and they tried to change it, the whole sort of Tony Benn movement, which, you know, had its weaknesses and so on, but it was an attempt to put that contradiction in the Labour Party right. I mean, there's a wonderful 
statement by um, Richard Crossman in the introduction to the to budget, you know, who was talking about the distinction between the appearance of the constitutional democracy and so on. Well, we don't have a constitution, but the unwritten constitution, it's claims for democracy, but the reality of elite rule. And he described the same sort of situation in the Labour Party, where there's this appearance of democracy, which leads people to, you know, canvas and pay their money and so on, but a reality of elite rule. Um, and, and the result of that is that, that so many of the institutions of, of of the rest of, of civil society, the trade unions, the um, you know, women's institute, the um, religious institutions, were kind of in their own sphere. You know, the trade unions were really, you know, to, to, to stick to industrial policy. You know, women's institutes on social policy, religious, you know, religious affairs. But actually, as the Labour Party has, has, has you know, increasingly and you know, dramatically not just failed to deliver the social aspirations for which it was created and people originally joined it, um, but also began to you know, undermine the creations of its earlier generations, undermine the NHS, perhaps the most dramatic, uh, because, well, it's a longer discussion, but clearly the, the Labour Party has prepared the way for the privatisation and breakup we're now seeing. But as that took place, then, in a sense, you see a sort of, I mean, kind of very, well, again, subordinate sort of political awakening of some of these as it were, apolitical social institutions. I mean, like the, the, the time that Blair spoke to the Women's Institute, thinking he could just have his way and sort of wheel his, his you know, support, and they just exploded. Um, you know, I, I recently, I've, I've, for the first reasons, I've been going to um, a chapel that's connected to my mum, who just recently died, and there was in this little chapel in East Leeds, you know, every Sunday, there was a highly political discussion. All the prayers were about Palestine and inequality. And, you know, so at the base, there is this sort of political kind of culture that is not, doesn't gain political expression. Um, and in a, but, in a, but what one's seen is that with the Labour Party, that precisely because it refused to open up to other movements of ex explosions like 68 and that whole generation, which both Anthony and I are part, I suppose, but, you know, the Labour Party refused, saw it was completely paranoid about that, that politics, um, and defined itself against it, and ultimately, you know, the whole way in which the GLC and all those, you know, uh, possibilities for renewal and for a, a rethinking of the Labour Party and its connection to popular movements and a, and a kind of different understanding of representative democracy, so that it was about representing real active social forces, as in Bolivia, rather than breaking um, the connection between social organisation and politics and atomising people purely at the level of the vote. So the Labour Party refused that possibility of rethinking itself. And in the end, in a sense, it isolated itself to the very level where it was bound to be defeated, uh, or its radical politics was bound to be, or its original conceptions were bound to be defeated, at the electoral level, because the electoral level, because of the electoral system, you know, is one that favours the centre. I mean, in a sense, I don't think it is adversarial. That's the point. It's not, it's a consensus. There's a sort of play of adversarialism, but we know what the parliamentary adversarialism is completely lacking in real sort of debate. So I've got to just about begin to wind up. But so the crisis of the Labour Party, which is serious, and, you know, you can see somebody like Ed Maliband, who is a, I you know, think is a genuinely... You know, he wants to see change, but he's completely imprisoned, you know, in a party that's been moulded to suit um, the, the, the status quo, to defer to the status quo, to defer to the city, to all the reactionary institutions of the British of, of British society. So he's completely trapped. I mean, I don't want to sort of shed tears, but, but recognise that, that that party is in a state of deep crisis and is not going to be able to deal with the, the, the explosion of, of revolt and discontent that is now going to be happening around the cuts. So we have, to, we have to take responsibility. We have to think how we create a new kind of politics that has got that self-confidence, has got the ability to, to develop, as Anthony said, some a, a coherent overall vision. So it's like, how do we develop a, an overview as it were, from beneath, an underview, a sort of totalizing underview. And this is where I think that we, we can learn from the kind of horizontal interconnecting politics that the, the new technology has made possible, but as a bit of an oldie and a sort of old feminist, I do want to insist that that network politics, 
the culture of it preceded the, te the, the internet, that the culture of, of horizontal interconnecting, of not always going through representative politics or through leaders or seeing leaders in this sort of um, uh, over and above kind of way. That began partly with the student movement in the 60s, 68, so on, and feminism and so on. I don't want to go on about that, but just to know there is a deep culture that's open to that kind of politics. And finally, because I must begin to end, um, or end, <laughs> um, I think that that what we're talking about in this new, well, it's not new, but it needs to be a break from the traditional institutional politics that we've inherited, is that it's about mobilizing power kind of on the in, you know, one of its sources of capacity is it, it's mobilizing power on the inside of society, the inside of the economy. So think now about the, the what's happening in the whole sort of new technology development, the whole development of the open software movement just last <coughs> week. There was the um, uh, declaration of the Free Culture Charter, which is which is mobilising people from within all aspects of the of the of the new economy, but also new technological dimension of the economy. But to to, to proclaim a different kind of um, economy, a different kind of culture. So I mean, I, I think it's important not to uh, to make a critique of representative politics that Alison has done, but not to to counterpose the notion I mean, of, of, of popular, um, um, horizontally organized, internally um, democratic forms of power with trying to address the electoral level, which must be a servant of that wider power, but is important for universal sort of issues like redistribution, uh, like you know, ownership, um, all the kind of issues which, which, and developing a new kind of constitution, always providing a framework for it. And I think the Bolivian model is is crucial to watch because one's seeing, in a sense, the driving force coming from below, from the social movements, um, but making the political system a, a, a kind of servant of that movement. And I think finally that does involve a completely new form of leadership, which in a way must be one that we all take on, which combines taking responsibility with constantly sharing power, disseminating power, and empowering others, which is where the popular education, uh, and, and a Freirean idea of popular education, which is what I think Alison's talking about, which is about bringing out the capacity of others.